Welcome back, everybody, uh, to CS162. We are uh, on lecture 19 talking about file systems. And uh, hard to believe, but uh, we're on the, the final uh, few lectures of the class. I think we're ending potentially on lecture 26. So getting close there. Um, if you remember from last time, we were talking about devices. And uh, among other things, we talked about spinning storage and uh, gave you some amazing stats about uh, modern disk drives. I'll uh, show you a couple of these in a moment. But um, basically, the way to think about a disk drive is it's a series of platters that are uh, double-sided. So there's storage on both sides. And uh, there's a single head uh, assembly, typically, with a, um, a, um, a, an actual read-write arm on both, both sides, for one for each platter. And that head moves in and out as a group. And um, given the current position of the head, if you let the platters spin, which is what they do, it traces out a path. And on a single surface, we call that a track. And if we take all of the tracks that are in, uh, traced out by, simultaneously by the head, we end up with a cylinder. All right. And uh, we talked about that. And the in, simple model for measuring how long it takes to get something off of the disk includes at least these three items, seek time, rotational latency, and transfer time. And uh, the seek time is the time basically to move the head in or out. And that's something of order of four milliseconds these days. The rotational latency is the time for uh, the resulting sector that holds your data to rotate under the head. And then finally, the transfer time is the time to actually pull a block of data off, uh, off the disk. Now, there's a good question here about, is there only ever one head? Now, um, just to be clear, usually the head is the thing touching the surface. So there's a head assembly. And uh, usually, there's only one of them. And the reason for that, even though it seems like it would make sense to be able to independently read the different platters, is that uh, disks are a commodity item. And that would be way too expensive. And the head is one of the most expensive parts of the assembly. So a uh, complete model of how long it takes to pull something on the disk or write something to the disk is that a request spends some time in a queue. We'll say a lot more about this today. Um, and then it goes through the controller. And then once it's in the controller, uh, then it gets fed out to the actual physical disk, at which point we have the seek plus rotational plus transfer time. And remember, by the way, the rotational latency, probabilistically, we say it's half of rotation because on average, it takes a half a rotation to get the data. Um, underneath the head. Any other questions here? OK. We showed you a picture or two of the inside of a disk uh, last time as well. So if you missed that lecture, you can go back and take a look. Um, here were some typical numbers. So um, I pulled out uh, commodity Seagate 3 and a half inch disks are now up to 18 terabytes, nine platters. Um, more than a terabit per square inch on each surface. So that's pretty amazing. Um, uh, we have uh, perpendicular recording domains. And so the, the magnetization that represents a one or zero actually goes into the surface. Typically, there's helium uh, inside there to help reduce the friction of the, the disk spinning around. Um, the seek time is typically in a four to six millisecond range. Um, Although uh, a good operating system with uh, good locality will get this down to a third of that time on average. This particular time that's uh, spec'd out is the um, average time to go from any track to any other track. All right. The rotational latency for uh, laptop or desktop disks is in the 3600 to 7200 RPM, which is somewhere between 6 uh, milliseconds per rotation or 8 milliseconds per rotation for the faster one. Server disks can get to be 15,000 RPM. Um, and so the latency is, is less. Uh, controller time depends on the controller hardware. Transfer time, typically 50 to 250 megabytes per second. Notice the capital B. Um, and it depends on a lot of things, like what size are you transferring. So sectors, which are the minimum a uh, chunk of data that can go on and off the disk can be um, 512 bytes or up to uh, four kilobytes on modern disks. Rotational speed, of course, we just said, can vary from 3,600 to 15,000 RPM. The density of bits per track, the diameter, and also where you are. So if you're on the outside, uh, 
um, the disk is surface is going by the heads faster than on the inside, and so you can read the bits quicker on the outside. Um, okay, so pretty amazing. Um, the other thing that we had talked about was we were starting to talk about the overall performance for an I/O path, and that performance really goes from the user through the queue, through the controller, through the I/O device. And uh, there can be many metrics that you might worry about, like response time, which is the time from when you submit a request to when you get the response back, throughput, which could be the time, how many of these requests per unit time can you get through the system. Um, things that contribute to latency are the software paths, which are green here, um, which can be loosely modeled by queues throughout the operating system. Uh, are the are hard to characterize in general, so we're going to have to come up with sort of a probabilistic way of thinking about those. The controller and the device itself, uh, that behavior is a little more easily characterized and depends on the, the uh, actual device itself. Um, but the queuing adds some really interesting behavior here. So there's this um, nonlinear curve that uh, starts out with a fairly low um, change in response time with respect to throughput. Um, and then as you get higher and closer to the 100% mark, which is really the point at which your utilization is uh, the maximum the disk can handle, this uh, response time kind of goes through the roof. And uh, we'll see a little bit about where that comes from in uh, this lecture. Okay, so now to pick up where we left off last time, unless anybody had some other uh, device-related questions. We talked a lot about uh, of um, SSDs as well as uh, spinning storage last time. So, um, so let's start talking a little bit about performance of a device in general. And we're going to call this a server. So for instance, here, this yellow I.O. device would be a server, or the combination of controller and I.O. device would be a server in this particular view of the world. And so if we assume that um, we have uh, some amount of time, call it L, that represents a complete uh, service of something. Then we could have several of these, one after another. And assuming that the device uh, takes time L to uh, service a request, and we put them right after each other, so there's really no spacing between submitting the next request after the first one's done, we could think of this as a deterministic server where the deterministic part is that it's always of time L. And um, the maximum number of uh, service requests per unit time is just 1 over L, OK? Because that's kind of the, the best we could do if we put them end to end as tightly as possible. And just to give you some numbers, for instance, if L is 10 milliseconds, then the bandwidth uh, of uh, number of Ls we can handle is about 100 operations per second. That's just 1 over 10 milliseconds. Um, on the other hand, if L is two years, then the bandwidth might be 2.5 uh, ops per year, et cetera. Okay. Now, um, this applies. This idea applies to a processor, a disk drive, a person, a TA, what have you. Um, it applies to getting burgers at McDonald's. You know, each one of these is the amount of time it takes to get a burger, uh, and you know, you can compute the maximum number of burgers that can be uh, pulled out of McDonald's, for instance. Okay. We'll get, we'll get back to McDonald's in a moment. Um, so the, we could take that L, which is a total operation, and we could divide it into a series of parts, like say three equal parts. And then um, we could imagine that those three equal parts are actually handled by three different stages of some device or some pipeline, what have you. So this should uh, sound a little bit like 61C. And so in that instance, here is our uh, L, which is spread over these three things. But since we're pipelining now, notice what happens. We have uh, the blue part, the gray part, and the green part. And so um, after you finish the blue part of the first request, and it's on to the gray part of the first request, then we can get the blue part of the second request, and so on. OK? And that's going to overall allow us to do more things per unit time. So it's going to up our throughput. OK? and so. For instance, uh, if you have a pipeline server like this with k stages and the task, the total task length is L, then we actually end up with time L over k per stage, and the rate is k over L. So again, we had a L equal 10 milliseconds, but now if we can divide it into, say, four pieces, um, then the bandwidth might be 400 ops per second. 
or if L is two years and K is two, then our bandwidth would be one op per year, okay? And so this is just noticing the fact that when we pipeline, we can get more items per unit time shoved down that pipeline. And of course, all of the things that uh, we talked about in 61C in that if these are not all equally, if all of these pieces aren't equally the same size, then you're gonna get bottlenecked by the, uh, the small one, okay? And so that's gonna be a problem. Um, and so let's, or actually, excuse me, bottlenecked by the large one, the one that has, takes the most time. Okay, now, example system pipelines are everywhere. So in 61C, you basically talked about the processor pipeline. Here, you could imagine that, for instance, you have a bunch of user processes, they make a syscall, they put things into the file system, queues them up, that's a pipeline um, doing file operations that then leads to uh, disk operations, which then lead to disk motion. Okay, or in communication, typically you've got a whole bunch of queues throughout the network and um, those queues all work for each other and you have a lot of routers and the routers are all working in parallel. And so uh, ideally, if you're communicating, say, between Berkeley and Beijing, you have a nice clean path with a lot of packets in the pipeline from point A to point B and they're all moving their way along. Okay, and we'll talk about that level of pipelining uh, when we talk more about networking in a, in a week or so. So anything with queues between an operational process behaves roughly pipeline-like. And so that analysis we were talking about applies. Now the important difference here is that initiations are decoupled from processing. So that means that um, the reason I put a queue here in the first place is so that the thing producing uh, the requests is de decoupled from the thing servicing the requests. And uh, this is extremely important in general because uh, request production is often very bursty. Okay, and this is certainly true um, with file system calls. It's certainly true with the network. It's certainly true with a number of other things. And so really we're gonna wanna be putting these cues in here to observe those bursts. And that synchronous and deterministic model that I you know, roughly gave you here is, is not reality, okay? The reality is that uh, we're gonna have burstiness. And so a lot of things are gonna arrive quickly, not at a regular rate, okay? So another thing we can do, which we haven't talked about, is we can increase our parallelism, not by pipelining, but ra rather by putting a bunch of servers in. So uh, that has a similar effect. So in the case of uh, these requests taking time L and not being able to be split up, if we put say three or four or N different servers, K different servers, excuse me here, then we can get K times uh, the number of things operating simultaneously. And so notice we get exactly the same numbers here. Latency is 10 milliseconds, K is four. We have four different servers. Then we could get 400 ops per second, et cetera. Okay. So there are, uh, the op there is the option to up your bandwidth by adding more servers or up your bandwidth by pipelining. Those two things um, are kind of duals of each other and uh, depends on circumstances as to which one are good. Now, so parallelism clearly comes into play, for instance, here, when we have lots of individual disk drives, it'd be great if certain things can be done in parallel. And uh, in a lecture, uh, or so actually, a couple lectures from now, we're gonna talk about things like putting a log in to give us um, better perform or to give us better durability uh, when things crash and it'd be great if we could have a separate disk drive to handle the log independent of the file system that'll give us higher performance um, clearly there's a huge amount of parallelism in the network and in the cloud and so when you submit a bunch of people submit queries they go throughout the network they go to different parts of the cloud and therefore there's a huge amount of parallelism as well and um, that leads to all sorts of interesting behavior. And we'll talk about um, network systems uh, in some detail in the last few lectures. So let's put together a little bit of a simple performance model. So here we have a hose, okay? Um, and uh, we have the latency L, which is the time for operation. So how long does it take to flow all the way through the system? That's L, so the latency is from the point where a little particle of water comes at the top until it goes through several times and comes out the bottom, that's L, 
bandwidth is sort of how many ops per second come into that hose or out of this pipe. And that would be operations per second, um, for instance, uh, or gallons per minute, et cetera, et cetera. And if B is two gallons per second and L is three seconds, then how much water is in this system in the, in the actual hose? Can anybody figure that out? Yep, six gallons, right? Why? Because two times three is six. And you know, you're, you're over the time that you've got those three seconds, you keep dumping water in. And so over that three seconds, you get two times three seconds worth of water in the hose. Okay, and so that's a, a pretty simple analogy. Hopefully, everybody's got uh, that's, and that turns out is going to be something called Little's law, which is going to be helpful for us to be able to get. Okay, you know, we can also so here we're talking about kind of uh, water, which is uh, you know dividable into as many little pieces as you like. We could also talk about um, chunks of work. So here's a case where. Um, each one of these little circles represents uh, some fixed amount of work. And so L is the time for um, us to get through the whole system now. And if the bandwidth is two operations per second are coming into this system and L is three seconds, once again, we'll have six operations, one, two, three, four, five, six, in the system at any given time. Okay, same idea. But now we're, we're looking at things that are quantized uh, rather than uh, continuous flow like water. Okay, so none of this is rocket science so far. Okay, so this is not intended to be complicated, but it's just intended to give you a way to think about some of these flow uh, ways of looking at things. Okay. Now, Little's law is a way to define that. Okay, and so Little's law talks about a system, which is this cloud, arrivals come in at a certain rate. And now instead of bandwidth, which is sort of maybe a norm, more normal thing for uh, you all to think about, we're going to talk about uh, lambda, which is a rate of things arriving, okay? And so just think of this as a different symbol for B. There's a length of time you're in the system, and there's the number of things that are in the system at any time. So things come in, they're in the system, they depart, okay? And in any stable system, stable meaning that n doesn't grow without bound and it doesn't shrink down to zero, on average, the arrival rate and the departure rate are equal to each other, okay? So lambda is arrivals per unit time, departures are departures per unit time. On average, the same number of things come in as go out so that this is a, this is a stable system. And when we talk about this probabilistically, what we're saying is on average, n is stable. It's neither growing or departing. Um, and so we're, we're not limiting ourselves to deterministic systems where n is always exactly the same amount, but on average, it's stable, okay? And so Little's law basically says that the number of things in a system is equal to the bandwidth times the latency, or n is equal to lambda times L, okay? And this is uh, universally applicable, no matter what the probability distributions of, of lambda um, are, you can use this and, and no matter what the distributions of L's are, so maybe not everything takes L time to go through the system, then uh, you can multiply it out and figure out how many jobs there are. And um, sometimes I go through a full proof of this uh, probabilistically, I decided not to do that tonight, but um, if you look at my slides from last year, you can see, or last term, you can see, um, see that proof. It, now, the, the way to think about this is A, you could look at the hose analogy that I just showed you, right? The other is this is, I like to think of this as the McDonald's uh, law, okay? And so imagine that what happens is a huge bus of uh, people shows up at a McDonald's, they all get out and, um, and they form a line, okay? And so the bus causes a certain rate of people to come in, that's lambda. And there's a certain line that goes in the door and to the front counter, okay? And if you uh, hit the door, if you come to the door and you look and you see so many people are in front of you and you wait in line, you wait in line, you wait in line, and on average, the same number of people are coming after you. If you looked from the door in and then you got to the counter and you turned around and you looked back, there ought to be the same number of people there because it's a stable system. And so the way to think of that is you take the speed at which they're coming through the door 
times how long you waited, and that tells you how many people ought to be in the line. All right, and that's so that's the the McDonald's uh, you know Big Mac equation here, Little's law. All right, questions. Okay, so the thing about this law is you can apply this to any number of things. You can draw a box around it, call something a system. It could be the queues, it could be the processing stages, it could be whatever you choose to draw your box around or your cloud around. Um, arrivals times average latency, average arrival time uh, speed times latency gives you the average number of jobs through the system. L is the time it takes from when an arrival comes to the system to when it departs. Okay, so again, in the in the McDonald's analogy, you you hit you come to the door, you look, and from the point at the door until you get to the counter, that's L, all right. And if you turn around and look back, N is the number of people behind you, and it's the same, hopefully, as the number of people that were in front of you when you got to the door. Okay, good. Now notice L has something to do with how happy we are or how annoyed we are, right? If L is really long and it took us a really long time to get our hamburger, we might be annoyed. Um, if L is short, we might be happy. And so L is that service time or that, uh, that we're interested in. How long did it actually take for us from the point at which we submitted our request to when we got our hamburger or we got our disk uh, satisfied, that's L, okay? And we're kind of interested in keeping L as short as possible, obviously, all right? Any other questions? Ah, why should we expect the system to be stable? Stable. That's a good question. The reason we expect the system to be stable is because if it's not stable, the, the math is much messier. <laughs> but in, in reality, so there is a um, queuing theory, which we're going to talk about, which has to do with stable systems. And in a stable system, if you can come up with lambda, um, and departure and, and a service rate, which we'll talk about. And you can then compute, assuming that things are arriving at a rate lambda, you can compute something about L, okay? If you're talking about what happens when the system first turns on and starts up, or maybe uh, the buses stop arriving uh, at five at night and the system drains, those transient analyses are much more complicated and that's a, that's a different queuing theory class, okay? So that's complicated. Um, so this has to do, uh, yeah, so this is related to E120 system stability, okay? Bounded input leads to bounded output. Um, but obviously the other thing that's of issue here is um, the, the type of queuing we're gonna talk about, we're gonna not put a bound on the queues to start with because the math is a lot simpler, okay? So if you wanna have some really interesting discussion about queuing theory, there are several classes in, on the EE side that can do it much more uh, deep, deeply. What I wanna do is give you enough to get back of the envelope calculations, all right? So, all right. Now, um, let's talk briefly for, for administrivia. Midterm two, we're still grading it. Um, seems like people thought it was long, but maybe easier than midterm one, I hope so. Um, we mostly had people uh, complying with the uh, screen sharing. Um, if you didn't, we'll probably be getting back to you because that was definitely a requirement. Um, but uh, we're hoping, I think, to have the grading done by the end of the week, maybe sooner. Um, I know that they're well on the way to being, to, uh, being through the grading, so that'll be good. Um, the other thing is, I didn't put this on the administrivia, but there is a uh, survey out for midterm survey. So please uh, give us your thoughts on how the course is going. You're, we're roughly a third of the way through, I mean, two thirds of the way through. So uh, let us know and we'll uh, see what we can do to help uh, make the end of the class um, easy, as easy and pleasant as it was at the beginning of the class. All right. The other thing, of course, that's really important is tomorrow, vote if you have the chance. Okay, uh, it's one of the most important things you can do. If you're allowed, don't miss the opportunity. Um, I know it sounds silly, but uh, people often say that if you don't vote, you don't get a chance to complain about how bad things are. I would say that's true. And this, um, my comment here has nothing to do with uh, what you vote for or who you vote for. That's, 
uh, totally up to you, but it's important that if you have the option to exercise your chance to vote. So uh, tomorrow is it, and, uh, and then we get to see, uh, I'm not sure what's gonna happen tomorrow. I'm a little uh, worried about it. We'll, we'll, hopefully things will go smoothly, we'll find out. And yes, take care of your mental health as the uh, results come in, all right? You share them, share the results with somebody else. All right. I know that people are talking about actually having vote watching parties this time. So they're not by themselves when the results come in. I know that's gonna be in my household. <laughs> okay, I don't really have any other administrivia for folks tonight, um, unless there were any questions. Um, our last midterm is uh, coming up in uh, the beginning of December. So we have a tiny bit of breathing room. And uh, project two is almost done. Okay. All righty. <laughs> yeah, I got the correction. All right, moving forward. So let's talk about uh, a simple performance model. So um, again, we have request rate lambda coming in now. We're going with the uh, queuing theory terminology. We have a queuing delay, which is how long um, things are in the queue. And then uh, the operation time T, which is the time to get uh, something sa satisfied. And then um, we can consider the queuing delay plus the operation time as L. That's one of our options. There are many other ways to draw L. Uh, to, to, and um, really what we've done here is we've put the cloud around, uh, around both the queue and the server in this case. And so this, uh, this spinning wheel could be an example of the disk, for instance, okay? And the maximum service rate, which is uh, how many items we can get through here per unit time is a property basically of the system as a whole, which is the bottleneck. And so uh, one of the things that we may need to look at to figure out what's the maximum rate we can serve things is what is the bottleneck, okay? And then once we know what the maximum, uh, rate that we could come up with, which by the way, if you have a bottleneck that slows things down, the U, uh, view max is gonna be lower than it would be otherwise, right? So bottlenecks tend to lower your, your maximum rate. We could talk about a utilization row, which is lambda over U max. So if you think about this, this is really just saying, if I have a maximum utilization rate and I have lambda coming in, I um, Rho is a number that varies from zero to one, which says sort of what total fraction of my maximum uh, service can I handle or am I trying to handle right now, okay? So if, if lambda is bigger uh, than mu, then I got a problem, okay? So this utilization here is a number that has to be less than one. So this is the correct ordering for the question in the chat, okay? Now, if you think about it, why is that? So lambda might be something like one hamburger per second. Mu might be a maximum of two hamburgers per second. That would be the utilization is half of the hamburger production uh, possibilities there. All right, good. Now, if, what happens if uh, rho is bigger than one? Yeah, requests start piling up, right? So um, in fact, row bigger than one in a steady state environment is really an unbounded and undefined situation, okay? So what we're dealing with in this uh, analysis that we're talking about here is, is the utilization is never allowed to be greater than one. In fact, the, um, the queuing theory uh, equations that we're gonna look at in a little bit have this behavior that they blow up when rho gets to one. So as rho gets closer and closer to one, the, the Q is gonna get bigger and bigger. The latency is gonna get bigger and bigger, okay? Everybody with me on that? Good. Now, how does service rate vary with the request rate? So if you look here, um, 
Umax, mu max, is basically the maximum number of items per unit time that I can handle. But if I ask for less, I'm not going to I'm not going to handle as many, right? So let's just think, assume for a moment that again, uh, mu max is two hamburgers per second, and I only ask for one hamburger per second. I'll look up on this graph, and what I'll see is, oh, I'm only asking for one ham hamburger a second. So the actual service rate that I go for is going to be one hamburger per second, okay? Because I'm not I'm not making use of all my capacity. Of course, as I get up to two hamburgers per second, that's the maximum that I can get out of the system. What happens if I ask for three hamburgers per second? Well, that's in the point at which things are starting to build up, and I'm certainly not going to get any more than two hamburgers a second, okay? So this, uh, this break point here represents a very crude model of what happens when you ask for more than you can get. And in reality, if you were to actually look at what the service rate is, it's going to be some smooth uh, function of this to the point that we're probably never going to quite get uh, the full maximum because of various overheads in the system. Um, and um, we could try requesting much more than mu max, but we're going to just build up our queues and we're not going to get any more out of the system. OK? Everybody with me? Now. So a couple of related questions might be, so here we have our queuing delay and our service rate, for instance, what determines mu max? Hmm. And what about internal queues? So when I said queuing delay here, D, I sort of implied it was one queue, but there might be lots of queues in the system. Okay. And so one of the things we need to figure out mu max is we need to do a bottleneck analysis. And so if we take a look at a, um, pipeline situation that we were talking about earlier. Remember, we had uh, each request requires a blue, a gray, and a green. What that could look like in our overall system is there's a blue server, a gray server, and a green server. They each have queues, and they feed into each other. OK, so this is um, our pipeline. And it's possible, if we look at this, if they're all of equal time, so these are all equal weight, then we could come up with a service rate that represents one over you know, what one of these little chunks are, which is, let's say, L over 3 or something. Now, unfortunately, uh, it may be that each of these stages aren't equally balanced. And so somebody has the slower mu max. Okay, And they're going to end up limiting the rate. So if you have mu max, for instance, uh, the third one, which is green, is the slow one, then what's going to happen is the queues behind it and everything else behind it are going to build up. And so you could view this really as a, a full system with one queue representing everything behind it and a service rate of mu max number three. And that's the system we're going to analyze. Okay, And so that's the bottleneck analysis where you figure out what the bottleneck is. Now, if the gray one were the bottleneck, what's going to happen is things are going to come out of here slower than they can be handled. And so these queues aren't, this queue isn't going to build up. Queues behind it will. Okay. And so the bottleneck analysis, you have to figure out what the bottleneck is and use that to figure out what mu max is. All right. And so really once we found the bottleneck, we can think of this in this other simpler way. Okay. So each stage has its own queue and maximum service rate. Um, once we've decided the green one is the slow one, then the bottleneck stage basically dictates the maximum service max. And we'll look at this as a single queue with a server that has mu max uh, number three. All right. Questions? Now. So for instance, let's look at something that you uh, we talked about earlier in the term. Here we have a bunch of threads. Suppose there are p of them, OK? And they're all trying to grab a lock. And that lock has some service time, which maybe um, requires going into the kernel and doing something coming back out. And so what happens is the locking ends up serializing us on the locking mechanism. OK? So um, there's a question here. Let me back up here for a second. So I didn't say in this uh, example that these are um, necessarily greater than lambda, all I said is that mu max 3 is slower than mu max 2 and mu max 1. Um, hopefully, that's, hopefully that was clear. So we're basically, we're coming up with the service side 
of this situation, not the request side. The request side is still lambda. Okay. Now, if it turns out that lambda is greater than mu max three, then we're in trouble. Okay. So that's maybe that's why you were thinking thinking that. All right. So um, so back to this example. So um, this is kind of an Amdahl's law thing, right? So we got all this parallelism, but the uh, the serial part is causing us trouble. Um, the the other way to look at this is basically that we have x seconds in the critical section. And so we have p threads times x seconds. The rate is 1 over x ops per second. Doesn't matter how many cores we've got. So this could be a 52 core uh, multi-core processor. Doesn't matter because all of these threads are drawn to a halt while they're trying to grab this lock. And so that's why it's an Amdahl's law kind of thing. But my rate is 1 over x ops per second. Okay, So this is certainly an example we can think about here. Mu max is 1 over x in this case. Okay, and the threads get queued up there. And um, if we have more threads coming in then uh, at a rate faster than one over X, then we know that the queue is gonna build up without bound and we're never gonna make it. Okay, so that, that analysis is, is uh, one that's hopefully familiar from earlier in the term. Um, but, uh, you know, we're gonna move this on. We're gonna talk about devices as well. So the other question we've been looking at here is so mu max is the service rate of the bottleneck stage. And so we can think of, as I said, that we really only have a single mu max server and a queue. And that basically is a good model for a bunch of queues, but by modeling over the only the um, bottleneck stage. Okay. So the tank here represents a queue of the bottleneck stage, including queues of all the previous stages. Um, in case of back pressure, um, basically, what happens is when queues build up, they sort of back up to the previous and the previous and the previous. And if you were to take all of those queues behind the bottleneck queue, that's kind of what this tank is representing. Okay, that's the big queue. Now, it's useful to apply this model to all sorts of things. We can apply it to the bottleneck stage. We can apply it to the entire system up to and including the bottleneck stage or the entire system. There's many different ways of drawing boxes and saying, well, what's the queue in this scenario? What's the bottleneck stage? Okay. So why do the so the queues behind the bottleneck stage um, are going to back up because uh, the bottleneck stage? Well, it depends. Okay. The question is, let me let me um, restate the question here. So why do the queues behind the bottleneck stage queue back up too? The answer is they do that only if the queues are finite in size, and so behind the bottleneck stage. When that queue fills up, it's going to prevent anything further from coming out with any of the previous servers, which are then going to back up and so on. Okay, so that would be true if each queue had a uh, maximum capacity. Okay, which in reality they usually do. Um, and so let's talk about latency for a second. So the total latency is queuing time plus service time. So from the this is again the McDonald's analogy, right? Here's the front door. Okay, which you go through the queue, you get to the de the uh, checkout counter, you get your hamburger, uh, however long that takes to process, and you exit. That's the total latency or service time. Okay, and the service time depends on all sorts of the underlying operations. So if we're processing and this is a C CPU stage, it could depend on uh, how much computation is involved. If it's an I/O stage, it could depend on the characteristics of the hardware. Like if it's a disk, it could depend on you know the seek time plus rotational latency uh, plus the uh, bandwidth coming off the disk, OK? So there are many different types of servers we could worry about here. They all they all roughly equivalent to this model. And so what about this queuing time? So we still haven't figured out how long are things in the queue. Now, if we were to um, ignore the previous discussion about um, queues backing up and instead allow this queue to be arbitrarily large, then uh, it's kind of an interesting question of how big is the queue on average? How many items are in the queue? And that's something where we need to pull in some queuing theory. Now, the queuing theory um, I'm going to give you in this class is going to be something that you can just apply. It isn't going to be, um, I'm not going to really derive it, although there are some references that I'm going to give you at the end which show the derivations. And they're pretty straightforward because this is a simple queuing theory. But um, so 
let's take a look at our systems performance model we have now. So we have Lambda is uh, items per unit time coming in. We have queuing delay, which is the time you sit in the queue. We have operational time, which is the time to actually do the operation or service time. And then we have the service rate U, mu, excuse me, and mu max is gonna be the one that we're really talking about because that's the bottleneck. Okay. And again, utilization is rho equals lambda over mu max. And we've already said that rho better not get to be bigger than one or we have some serious problems. And in fact, in the model you'll see in a bit, um, if rho equals one, we also have sort of infinite latency. So that's um, really big, okay? So when will the queue start to fill? Well, the queue is gonna start to fill when uh, we're busy servicing something and something else comes in, right? Um, so some questions about queuing. We could say, well, what happens when the request rate exceeds the maximum service rate? We already did that, that's uh, queue's gonna fill up. Short bursts can be absorbed by the queue if on average lambda is less than uh, mu, okay? And so we don't actually require that lambda is always, um, is always smaller than mu max. What we say is on average, lambda is less than on average mu max, okay? So mu max, actually we can start talking about a probabilistic service time, in fact, we will in a bit, and a probabilistic entry time or entry speed. And those two things, entry rate, service rate, uh, can be probabilistic averages. And as long as the average lambda is less than the average mu, then we're good, okay? And it's only if we have prolonged lambda greater than mu that we have problems, okay? So let's talk about a simple deterministic world here. So a deterministic world, uh, which unfortunately we don't live in these days, um, is as follows. We have a queue for arrivals come into the queue, and we have uh, T sub Q items perhaps in the in the total, excuse me, we have a total of T sub Q time in the queue, and then we have the service time T sub S, and here's some numbers over the left you can see here. So um, let's suppose in the deterministic world, um, somebody comes in every T sub A, every T sub A without fail and with no probabilistic uh, variation. So now we can say that lambda, which is the rate that people are coming in is one over T sub A. And the service time T sub S mu is, uh, well, it's K over T sub S if there's K servers there, okay? And then finally, the total queuing time L is equal to uh, T sub Q plus T sub S. So if I wanna say, what's my total time to get my hamburger, it's the time in the queue plus the time to be served. And that's how long I'm in the McDonald's, okay? Now, if we take a look here, what do we got? So if we have um, an item comes in every T sub A, okay, so this is, uh, we're in, this is what McDonald's looks like, uh, like maybe 2.30 or something, right? Uh, in the afternoon when nobody's coming in. So uh, a new person comes in every T sub A, it takes you, um, you spend a very short time in the queue. In fact, you're probably, it's the time to walk from the door to the counter. And then it takes some service time to get your hamburger. And notice that um, the important thing here is this service time, which tells me what my service rate is, one over my maximum service rate, one over T sub S, is shorter than T sub A. So we're making sure that the time it takes to get the hamburger uh, you're completely done by the time the next one's ready to go, okay? Otherwise, you start building up the queue. Okay, and so, um, and since we're pipelining, so the time sitting in the queue versus the service time, that's okay as long as T sub S over T sub A is less than one in this instance, okay? And this is totally deterministic. There's no probabilities here at all. And so in a deterministic world, uh, we have um, rho, which is the utilization, basically goes from zero to one, okay, which is lambda over mu, which is T S over T sub A. Okay, looking back here, notice T sub S over T sub A is gonna be our utilization, okay? And if we look here that um, if our utilization is from zero to one, our delivered throughput, which is the maximum we can get, against one is goes from zero to one. So what do I mean by that? So our delivered throughput, 
um, our maximum throughput here is uh, one item every T sub S, okay? And so if we shove a new item in every T sub S, we would end up with a uh, delivered throughput of one and a uh, utilization of one. And so at this point here, this is the point at which everything's coming in at the maximum rate it can without building up the queue. Okay, and then we've got our saturation we saw you earlier and the point at which your utilization gets bigger than one, now you're building your queue up and basically people are out the door and down the street and then around the block. Okay. And in this deterministic world, what happens is if you look at queuing delay as a function of time, uh, if you um, basically build things up too, too large, then uh, the amount of time it takes is, uh, this should be actually utilization on this axis, sorry about that. You build things up, once you get past the um, large queuing delay, then you basically start growing without bound as to how long it takes to get your hamburger. Now, let's look at what happens with bursts, okay? So the nice thing about deterministic is it's very easy to understand, right? You can clearly see that once you get um, too many of these T, T sub S's coming in so that you're, um, they're coming in faster than this, um, than the rate, excuse me, you have too many items coming in so that they're coming in faster than the rate, then you've got a problem and you can no longer satisfy your, um, without building up your queue. Okay, so if we look in a bursty world, we got a different problem, okay? So in the bursty world, notice the arrivals are coming in, servers is handling things, but now the time between arrivals is gonna be random. Okay, and so there's gonna be a random variable. And so people are gonna arrive, you know, in a second and then in three seconds and then in two seconds, there's gonna be variation of how long they wait. And now things look a little different, okay? So look what happens here. Somebody arrives, they get through the queue and now the hamburger is being cooked up and they're, they're uh, you know, they're waiting for the hamburger. But meanwhile, somebody else comes in and now they came in, uh, at this point, okay, and right after the blue one came in, so the blue one's being served, the white one came in, and now the white one can't be served. Why is that? Well, because the blue one's being served. So all of this time from when the white one came in to when uh, the blue one is done, the white one's waiting. And meanwhile, an orange one came in, now the orange one's waiting. And a light blue one came in, and now the light blue one's waiting. And they're all waiting for the original person to get their hamburger, okay? And now once the original person gets their hamburger, now the white one gets their hamburger, okay? And that's gonna take in a time to make hamburger. And then finally the orange one gets, and then the blue one gets their hamburger. And there might be some uh, space here where nobody's coming in, and then we might start over again. And notice in this scenario, the average number of uh, customers per unit time could be exactly the same as the deterministic one, except we have some burstiness where a bunch of them come in and then we have uh, empty spots where nobody comes in. And if you notice what happens here, the blue uh, person is very happy because they get their hamburger in their normal time, but white is not so happy because white waits from the point they came in until a much longer period to get their hamburger because they're sitting in the queue. Orange is even worse, right? Orange comes in and they have to wait until here to get their hamburger. And light blue has to wait until there to get their hamburger. So light blue is really waiting a long time, okay? And so just the addition of burstiness, even if with the same average time, T sub A, okay, average, we end up with uh, a hugely increased waiting time, okay? Questions? Just randomness on the input. Okay, does everybody see, everybody see how it is that white here comes right away after the, light, the blue one came in, but now they're sitting in the queue all this time and then they get to be served and then they're done. And so white is basically waiting from the point they come in the door to here before they have their hamburger and blue just waited a short time. So the average waiting time is much longer than in the deterministic case, yes. Even though the average person per unit time, even though lambda is the same in the two cases, uh, when there's burstiness, the uh, arrivals, there are the average waiting time goes up, okay?
Yes. Pretty strange, right? So randomness causes all sorts of weirdness. Okay. Now, of course, the other thing is we'll talk about average waiting time, which is really, you know, blues time from the moment they came in to when they have their hamburger versus whites till they have their hamburger versus orange till they have their hamburger averaged over the whole system. That's going to be a number that we're going to compute in a, in a moment. All right. Now, so re requests arrive in a burst. So the queue actually is, is uh, fills up. Whereas in this previous case, in the deterministic case, with all of the parameters the same, there's never anybody in the queue, right? Somebody comes in, they, they, their queue is really kind of a, a null queue because they have to walk to the counter, they get their hamburger. There's never anybody waiting, ever. Okay, so that's a case where the queue basically is, is, not a, is not filling up at all. Whereas in the bursty case, we actually fill up the queue. Here, you can look at the queue, basically has uh, depth three at this point when the, when the light blue one person has come in. You now have white, orange, and light blue sitting in line, and now you only have orange and blue, and now you have blue, and now you have nobody. Okay, good. I don't want to belabor that point. So, same average arrival time, but almost all the requests experience large, in, large queuing delays, even though the average utilization is low. So, on average, we're not necessarily using uh, all of our hamburger time that we could, but uh, people coming in in bursts means they end up waiting in line. And you know, if you think about this, this is really your common experience coming in when everybody shows up at noon uh, at a Pete's Coffee, you have that queuing problem, right? And that queuing problem is because of the burstiness of the arrival. Now, how do you model burstiness of arrival? So the time between arrivals is now a random variable. And there is a, a lot of, uh, elegant math that we're not going to go into in great detail, but one of my favorites is the thing uh, called a memoryless distribution. Okay, and so this is um, the uh, what is the probability that the time between now between the uh, the first guy that arrived and the next guy that arrived is uh, a given value, and it has an exponential curve that looks like this. In fact, the probability distribution. Is, uh, is lambda e to the minus lambda x, and that's what I've plotted here, okay? Lambda, in this instance, is the arrival rate, okay? Um, and this shows you the probability distribution of how long it takes to uh, between the um, first guy and the second guy. And the question is, why do they call this memoryless? Well, the reason they call this memoryless is if you remember your probability, uh, if I were to say, well, I've already been waiting for two units of time, what's my conditional probability given I've already waited for two, so I cut off the first two and I rescale everything, and what you see is it's exactly the same curve. So the reason they call that memory list is the amount of time that you've waited says absolutely nothing about how long you're going to wait. Uh, and that's uh, just like buses in Berkeley, right? You've, you've, waited, you've waited for an hour, and that tells you nothing about what, how much more time you're going to wait because it's a memory list distribution. Uh, all right, and so the mean inter-arrival time, which is the amount of time uh, between each uh, arrival is one over lambda, okay? There's lots of short arrival intervals, okay? And there's uh, many, there's a lot of short ones and there's a few really long ones and the tail's really long, okay? So um, I understand the buses in SoCal are better or worse than in Berkeley. What's the implication there? Worse, so SoCal buses are dead. Well, all right. I guess I guess in the memoryless model, we're assuming that the bus will eventually come. It may be days later, but at least it'll show up. Um, so anyway, so this here's what's cool about memoryless distributions. If you don't know anything about the probability distribution for arrivals, but you know uh, that there's a, a bunch of factors that all feed together to generate the random variable, then you can, you can often model it as a memoryless uh, distribution without knowing anything else. Okay, so for instance, if you have uh, a bunch of, here's how we use it often, you have a bunch of processes that are all making disk requests and they're all random about it, but they're not correlated in any way. And they all submit at random times and what have you, but 
you know, if you look overall at the, the rate at which requests are submitted, there's a rate there, so many requests per second, then you could figure out what that uh, request per second is and then model it as a memoryless distribution and it gets you somewhere. It may or may not be perfect, but at least it's a start, okay? And so people often use memoryless distributions uh, to model input distributions when the only thing they have is the rate of arrival, okay? Um, but notice the thing to realize is that lots of short uh, burstiness at, uh, for short events and then some really long ones, the so long tails, okay? And um, so the simple performance model here, the Q, um, we have uh, lambda in, the rate out, and the Q basically grows at rate uh, mu minus lambda. If you think about it, that makes sense because we have a rate in and a rate out, and when the rate in is faster than the rate out, then the Q is growing on average mu minus lambda, okay? All right, now, Let's very quickly uh, remind you of some things and then we'll um, put up a queuing result. So um, one thing to remember is uh, if we have a distribution of service times, so think of this as the disk, how long does it take to get something on the disk? We can talk about a couple of things. So there's the average or mean, right? That's uh, the sum of uh, the various um, items at T times T um, and that's the mean, okay, probability. And that's the center point, and you can think of this as exams, right? And then there's the variance or the standard deviation squared, okay? And that represents the um, the amount of time or the uh, how far off the distribution goes from the mean. So you could have a peak where everything's the mean, and then the standard deviation be zero. Otherwise, it tells you about the spread, okay? Okay, and those two items hopefully are very familiar with you from exams and everything, right? What's the average of the exam? What's the standard deviation? This thing about uh, sigma squared, standard deviation squared is called the variance. That's uh, a little easier to compute. So usually you compute the standard, the uh, sigma squared and then you take the square root to get the mean, uh, to get the standard deviation. And then the um, squared coefficient of variance is an interesting one, which I'm sure you probably have never seen. And that's where you take the variance divided by the mean squared. And that's a unitless number, all right? And the thing that's funny about C is you can learn a lot, no matter how complicated this distribution is, you can learn a lot about it based on C without knowing anything else, okay? Now, let me pause here for a moment because I'm assuming this is mostly review for you guys, but are there any questions on this simple thing, all right? So if you look at, what's on the x-axis is um, how long you're waiting for the bus, for instance. Each of these little uh, slices underneath is a probability that you're gonna wait this amount of time, this amount of time, this amount of time, this amount of time. Um, and there's a way to compute the mean, which is here, uh, and the way to compute the standard deviation. And that tells you both what's the average amount of time you wait and what's the um, spread, okay? And the key thing about memoryless distributions is that their exponential shape, okay, means that you don't learn anything after you know how long you've waited. Okay, P of T is the probability that you wait time T. So if you were to look at this as a curve that everything sums to one, then P of, uh, pick a T, like here's T, this is that you waited two hours. The error, the area under that curve kind of is P of T or the, or the height of that curve is P of T. Does that help? So um, you take an integral in the continuous case and you'd use that. These things that are shown as sums would be integrals in the continuous case. Yes, exactly. Correct. Now, this memoryless distribution, actually it turns out C in that case is one, okay? Because uh, the variance and the square of the mean are equal to each other and C is one. So. Oftentimes, when you see a C of one, you, uh, you actually end up with something that's behaving like a memoryless distribution. Even all the other weird things that don't look like this curve and have a C of one will oftentimes behave in a queuing standpoint as if it were memoryless, which is kind of interesting. Um, the past, in, when C is one, the past says nothing about the future. Uh, when there's no variance, which is deterministic, C is zero. Why is that? Well, that's because the variance is zero and therefore C is zero. 
Um, there's another thing is if you have uh, SQL 1.5, for instance, typical disks have a SQL 1.5, for instance, that's a um, situation where the variance is a little wider than memoryless, and so you end up with uh, slightly different distribution, but that's typically what people see on disks. Okay, so to finish this off, now um, if you think about queuing theory, we've been leading up to this anyway, but you can imagine a queuing system where you draw a box around a queue in a server. You have arrivals and departures. The arrivals on average equal the departures on average, otherwise the system blows up. Uh, the arrivals have a probabilistic distribution. The service times have a probabilistic distribution. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to figure out how big the queue is on average. Okay, and so for instance, with Little Law, Little's Law applied to this, uh, we can say that if we know the amount of time I wait in the queue, T sub Q, times lambda, which is the rate at which things come in, that'll tell me how long the queue is. So if we could say compute one of these guys, we could get the other one pretty easily. So uh, perhaps we're interested in seeing whether we could compute T sub Q, and then we can figure out the length of the queue later, okay, just by using Little's Law. All right, so some results. So assumptions are, first of all, that systems in equilibrium, we talked about that earlier, there's no limit to the queue time between successive arrivals is random and memoryless, for instance, okay, on the input. So we're gonna, we're going to go back to our notion that memoryless uh, oops, up here represents um, a situation where you have a bunch of random things that are uncorrelated that all sum together and are coming in, we'll call it memoryless with some lambda. And what we're going to do is our queuing theory uh, is going to assume that. Okay. And so the departures are going to be um, an arbitrary distribution, but the input's going to be memoryless. Okay. So if you look here, we have an arrival rate lambda, which is a memoryless uh, distribution, and a service rate, which could be an arbitrary distribution, so like a disk drive, <clears throat> and mu is going to be one over the time to service, okay? And that's just T sub S is the average time to service the customer. C is going to be the squared coefficient of variance on the server. And so in a typical problem, you're going to get a couple of these variables and you'll have to compute the other one. So oftentimes, for instance, you might have to figure out what C is. And usually you have a very clear way to figure that out. Like this is a deterministic server time where it always takes exactly the same amount of time to service. That would be C equals zero. Or this is a memoryless service time, then you know C equal one. Or it's something else and we tell you what C is, okay? Um, so usually you'll be able to do that pretty easily. Notice that if you know that the average time to serve something you can take one over that to get mu, or if you know mu, you could take one over that to get the average service time. So these are related to each other. Um, and so typically getting three of these variables, you can get the other two. Okay. And so for instance, a memoryless service distribution is often called an MM1Q. This is where not only is the input memoryless, but the output server is memoryless as well. And so you would say, that um, in that MM1Q where C equals one, then the time in the queue is actually rho over one minus rho times the service time. So if your disk on average took a second and you know what rho is, like say rho is a half, okay, then you could say a half over one minus a half, which is one, says that the time in the queue is about, a, is about uh, 0.1 seconds or 0.5 seconds, right? So this is a very simple MM1Q distribution. And amusingly enough, if you have a general service time, which is not memoryless on the output, um, you can just say one plus C over two. So the only difference in this is that C is now varying if you have something that's general. And if you notice the difference between this first one and the second one, uh, if C equals one, then one plus one over two is one. And so these two are uh, uh, this one merges into that one when C equals one and you have a memoryless input. Okay. Now, yes, 126. There's some similarities here. Fortunately, we're not going to go any further with, than this. Okay. Are the dashes part of the equation? No, I'm sorry. This is a little confusing. This dash is the, uh, the dash is part of the, um, part of the uh, 
PowerPoint here. I realize that's confusing. My apologies. In fact, you know what? I'll I'll fix the slide when I put up the put up the um, the PDF so that it doesn't have the dashes there because I agree that's bad. So here's some uh, results here. If we know what the time in the queue is, which we can just compute based on this. If you know utilization, you know the service time. You get the time in the queue from Little's law. We can get the length of the queue. All right. If we uh, we can compute rho by saying it's lambda over mu max or lambda times t sub s. And so we can work this all out and find out, for instance, that the length of the q is rho squared over 1 minus rho. I hope you've all seen this 1 over uh, this uh, 1 minus rho in the denominator. That means that as rho gets closer to 1, what happens to this equation? Or all of these equations as the utilization goes to 1, what do we see? Infinity, that's right. So this is a curve that blows up, all right, just like you've been seeing, OK? And so rather than the ideal system performance we saw, the moment we have some randomness on the input, we suddenly have, a, we don't have that green curve. Instead, we have the time in the queue is rho over 1 minus rho, and we get this, OK? So the latency goes up to infinity as we get close to mu max in our input rate, which is the same as getting close to rho equal 1. OK, and so this behavior is because of this. These equations all have rho or 1 minus rho in them, and rho is uh, lambda over mu max. So as lambda over mu max goes to 1, we blow up. OK, and so this is a very funny side effect of randomness on the input, because if we had determinism on the input, we would get the green curve. OK, look at the difference, in, and obviously we wouldn't be going past one here either, but we would have much less of a blow up. OK, so why does the latency blow up as we approach 100%? Because the Q builds up on each burst and it never drains out. And so you got a problem. OK, very rarely do you get a chance to, to drain. And so pretty much, I, I, I think of this uh, curve here as a, as a um, indicator of all sorts of things in engineering and life for that matter you never want to get close to 100 percent utilization on anything because all of the things you're going to encounter have this blow up behavior as you get close to 100 percent um, and that's because there's just randomness in pretty much everything and just that little bit of randomness causes this weird behavior and now you got to worry about that 100 percent and you know think about it you got a, a bridge that's uh, set at 100 um, you know, 100 uh, tons, you don't want to be running 99 tons over that bridge because you know the slight randomness on the input of that weight with some extra wind or whatever is going to cause the bridge to collapse and you got a problem. Okay. Um, one thing that's interesting is this what we would call the half power point, which is a load at which the system delivers half of its peak performance. Okay. Because keep in mind that what we're seeing here is latency. All right, what is latency is the time from when I get into the front door of the McDonald's to when I have my hamburger. That's what I perceive as latency. However, what we do have and we do know is that when we look at this half power point where lambda is equal to mu max over two, that's the point at which uh, the servers that are at the counter are basically handling half as many hamburgers per unit time as they could. It doesn't matter that I, as a hamburger user, see a really long latency. I'm getting a lot of hamburgers out the door if I'm the McDonald's. In fact, as I get closer to one, I'm actually happy here because uh, as a McDonald's owner, because I'm getting my maximum hamburger rate out the door. But from the standpoint of the overall system, this half power point is often a really good point to be because it's kind of that point just before things really uh, go blow up on latency. And so it's the point at which things are the system is operating pretty well. Once you get to the right of that, now you got problems and you got to start worrying about there being um, basically too much load in the system. Okay, and that's when you got to start thinking about this. Okay, what do you do? And you can do lots of things. Um, if I want to get lambda over mu max to be smaller, I could make mu max bigger, right? How would I, what's the simplest way to make mu max twice as big as it was before in the case of hamburgers? Anybody think about that? Mm 
add a server. Exactly. Double the restaurant. If you double the number of people cooking hamburgers, what you did was you pulled yourself back from the brink, back to the half power point. Okay, order from another McDonald's. Yes, you could do that too. That's another server. So the point here is that we could go for more servers or we could try to reduce Lambda. Those are two ways of improving our current situation. Okay, and, and I wanted to close this a little bit. So first of all, I wanted to back up here and show you. So I can compute if, I, actually, let's go back to this one. If I know C and I can compute rho and I know T sub S, then I can come up with T sub Q, which is then gonna let me with Little's law figure out the length of the Q. So pretty much three items, rho, C and T sub S or different combinations of the one of these guys down below, give me enough to come out with how long somebody waits in the queue, which gives me enough to figure out uh, what the link, the uh, number of items in the queue are. So the way to come away from today's lecture is once you've figured out how to identify these different pieces, then you can plug them in and you can get a back of the envelope estimation of where you are in the curve. Okay, where are you in this curve here? Are you in the reasonable linear area here where uh, a slight increase in utilization doesn't blow up the time? Or are you in the, in the part here where a very slight increase in utilization suddenly gives you everybody a huge increase in average latency time? Okay, that's what you wanna get out of these equations, okay? And so let's take a look here just for a moment to remind you of the deterministic case, right? Here's a case where something arrives, it's gonna get serviced, Another one's gonna arrive, service, arrive, service. And I'm gonna have the arrival be deterministic with no bursts and the service time is deterministic. And what I see as a result is I can compute the average arrival rate and the average service time. So the average arrival rate is one over the service time. The average service time is one over service time. And Lambda is exactly equal to mu in this deterministic situation but it doesn't blow up. Why? There's no randomness on the input, right? Because I can exactly service 100% if they're all uh, point to point next to each other and things arrive at exactly the right rate. Okay, so you can imagine this never happens in reality. Instead, we have this, where even though we have the same average arrival rate, we put some burstiness in, which is we have a bunch of them show up and a bunch of other ones show up and we have these long tails of time. And what happens is when we get our burst, we're gonna start servicing them as quickly as we can because they're in the queue. And then we have this little long tail where nothing happens for a while. And then we get another burst and so on. And why do we get this response time as we get close to 100%? It's because when we got burstiness, we've got these little gaps and we never have a chance to make up for our missing time, okay? So that's why burstiness leads to this curve uh, of growth, okay? Good. So let me give you a little example here. So suppose the user requests 10 8K disk IOs per second. The request and service times are exponentially distributed. So that means that C is equal to one. So uh, exponentially distributed memory list, those two are the same thing, right? Average service time at the disk is 20 milliseconds, which I'm gonna say is controller plus seek plus rotational plus transfer uh, added together on average, it'll be 20 milliseconds. And so we can now ask these questions like how utilized is the disk? Rho is equal to lambda times the service time. Okay, so what's, uh, what's lambda here? Well, lambda is 10 uh, requests per second. The service time is 20 milliseconds. Okay, and so I can compute Lambda is 10 per second. The service time is 20 milliseconds, which is 0.02 seconds. Don't forget to keep your units together. And so rho, which is the server utilization, is just lambda t sir. So the utilization here is 0.2. So 0.2 is a low utilization, so I know that I'm doing okay. All right. And um, so the time in the queue is just the service time. Oh, by the way, I'll fix this. This is rho over one minus rho. Sometimes people use u as utilization. Um, so rho over one minus rho is 20 times 0.2 over one minus 0.2. I compute that, I get five milliseconds or 0 0.005 seconds. So the time I'm sitting in the queue is only five milliseconds. The time service from the disk is 20. 
the total time from when I submit the request to when I'm done is 25 milliseconds, right? That's the sum, okay? And the average length of the queue here is only 0.05. So this queue is really not building up, <laughs> right? It's got an average 0.05 things in it. If I uh, make the request much faster, I will very quickly get to where the queue completely dominates all of the time on this. All right, good. Questions before I put this? And I'll fix this uh, u over 1 minus u. This is rho over 1 minus rho here, sorry. I switched my notation to be consistent with somebody else, and I missed one. All right, good. Um, so the average time, so never forget this, right? How long do I sit in McDonald's? It's my time in my queue plus the time being served. So in this case, it's uh, the 20 milliseconds being served, and the five milliseconds in the queue gives me 25 total milliseconds. OK, good. So you're now good to go on solving a queuing theory problem. OK, and there's a bunch of good resources that we have up on the resources part. So you can take a look at some readings and so on, OK? And there's some previous midterms with queuing theory questions as well. But you should assume that maybe queuing theory is fair game for midterm three. Now, um, so now we can, um, how do we improve performance if our queue is going crazy? We can make everything faster, OK? Well, we get, uh, we, we hire a bunch of really crazy hamburger uh, fryers, and we um, give them, you know, 10 times the heat on the grill and they have to flip really fast and maybe that's faster. Or we could put more of them, okay? Steroids, that's right. Hamburger flippers on steroids. We could have more, more parallelism. That's a more reasonable thing to do, right? Um, we could optimize the bottleneck. Well, we could figure out what is the bottleneck in frying hamburgers. Maybe it's getting the hamburgers uh, from the back. Who knows what it is, but we could optimize that to make the overall service times better. And we could do other useful work while waiting. So that's kind of what we do with paging, where we switch to another um, process to run it while we're waiting for the disk to complete our page in. Okay. Queues are, in general, good things because they absorb bursts and smooth the flow. But anytime you have a queue, you have the potential for a response time behavior that goes like this. Okay. And so queues are, are uh, both a blessing and a curse from that standpoint. And oftentimes, what you do is you limit the maximum size of a queue so that if the bursts are too much, then what happens is you put back pressure and you slow down whoever is generating the requests by explicitly telling them they can't submit anymore because the queue is full. So that's a, that's a response to a queue being too full, and a lot of systems do that as well. Okay, And you could have uh, finite queues for admission control, and that's what I just said. Okay, All right, questions? Now, when is disk performance the highest? It's the highest when there are big sequential reads, right? What's that mean? That means that I move the head and I rotate to get the starting point, and then I just read a whole bunch of blocks off the disk, a whole bunch of sectors, OK? Or when there's so much work to do that um, you have many requests, and what you do is you piggyback them together, and you move the disk. Uh, in a way that optimizes for all the set of requests that are out there rather than individual ones, which may cause you to move around. Okay? And when the disk is not busy, it's okay to be mostly idle. Okay? So births are bad because they fill queues up, but they are an opportunity because if we have a bunch of requests, we may be able to reorder things and get better overall efficiency of our disks. Okay? And so you can come up with many other ways of optimization here. Um, you know, maybe you waste space by replicating things and so that when you go to read, it's faster. So when we talk about RAID, one of the things we get out of RAID is we have multiple copies of things which make it faster to read uh, when we're under high load because we can choose to get our data off of any of many different disks at a time, OK? So that gives us a way to do parallelism. Um, we have, may have user level drivers to try to reduce queuing uh, as represented by software in the kernel. Um, maybe we could reduce the I.O. delays by doing other useful work in the meantime. There are many ways of making things faster, okay? But I want to close out uh, this discussion. I was going to talk a little bit about the FAT file system today, but I think I'll save that for next time. But I do want to 
say a little bit about scheduling to make things faster, okay, that's useful from a disk standpoint. So suppose um, we, we recognize the fact that the head uh, is assembly is, is stuck together. And so we have to move the head as a unit. And so um, how do we optimize this thing? Because anytime we deal with mechanical movement, like moving the head or waiting for a rotation to happen, things slow down. Okay, and so uh, if we allow ourselves to queue up a bunch of requests, we could do one thing, which is the obvious one, which is we handle the first request. This is basically saying we go to track two, sector three, track two, sector one, track three, sector 10, track seven, sector two. So we could take them in the exact order in which they were queued, and that would be okay, I guess, except that we could very easily have to go all the way into the, to the inside of the disk and then all the way to the outside and back to the end and so on um, because we have a set of requests that don't have any locality with them. The alternative is to try to optimize for our head movement, okay? And so this one example here is the SSTF or shortest seek time first option where you pick the request that's closest on the disk. And so if the disk head is here, I might go request one, then request two, then request three, then request four. And what I'm doing is I'm reordering my requests uh, so that they're one, two, three, four, so that um, the disk head is kind of spiraling its way out in a single movement, okay? And so this is, um, and although this is called SSTF today, you have to include all sorts of things like rotational delays in the um, calculation since it's not just about optimizing for seek, you also have to optimize for rotation. Uh, the pros of this is that you can minimize your, your head movement as long as you have a bunch of things queued up. The cons is you can lead to starvation because it's possible that if a bunch of things keep arriving on the queue and you force the disk head to keep servicing things uh, in the local area, you know, maybe on the inner part of the disk, inner tracks, you may never get to the outer tracks. And so SSTF could optionally, um, even as you're limiting the disk movement, you're causing a lot of requests to get stuck and never serviced, okay? So that's a problem. And now this kind of goes back to our scheduling when we were talking about the CPU scheduling, where we could end up with low priority tasks and never essentially getting any CPU. What's a low priority read? Well, a low priority read in this case is something that's far away in tracks relative to the uh, continually arriving requests. Now, another thing we could do is, uh, which is often called the elevator algorithm, is we take the set of requests and rather than doing that movement uh, on the fly by taking a look at the queue, we instead uh, move in a single direction at a time. So um, we started a given track, we spiral our way out, then we spiral our way in and so on. And as we're doing that, we grab all of the requests that are um, relevant to our given direction and position. Okay, and you can see why this is called the elevator algorithm because it's just like an elevator, just rotate this side on its side and imagine an elevator going up and down. That's exactly what happens. It sort of stops at each floor, services people and so on. The analogy of which floor is of course, which cylinder you're on. And we deal with that by, uh, by sorting the input requests. Okay. Now, one of the things that we might worry about this is that this has a tendency to um, favor tracks that are in the middle because we're kind of going out and coming back in and there's a lot more time kind of spent on the inside. And so there is something called circular scan, which is nominally a little better where we always uh, service going in one direction and then we have a very quick spin back to another place and go out, okay? So that's, uh, that's the circular scan or C scan. Questions? Now you might imagine asking, who does this? Well, clearly the operating system could, right? The operating system could take a look at all the requests that are, are um, it's waiting on, and it could do a reordering of them so as to do either the elevator or the faster, the C-scan uh, algorithm, and uh, thereby optimize head movement. So remember, that this is only useful when we have a full queue. If we have an empty queue, it doesn't matter because we're not um, trying, we're not overloading the resource. 
Um, so we wait, you know, when there is a queue, then we, re we reorder it based on C-scan. Now the issue that's of interest, which can anybody tell me about modern disks and possibly optimizing like this? Is this something that the operating system wants to do? What do you think? What could be a what could be a downside of the operating system doing this? Can anybody think? I think people are thinking too hard. Okay. Very good. We have some interesting uh, comments in the chat. So first of all, um, the operating system has to know the head location. So that's a that's an issue, certainly. And we'll uh, we'll talk more about this moving forward. But um, in modern disks, the controller takes in a series of requests and does all of this reordering itself. So in many cases, the modern operating system and device driver doesn't even know exactly where the disk head is or how the logical block IDs actually map to physical blocks. So that's one issue. The second issue is that the modern controllers actually take a bunch of requests in and do the elevator algorithm themselves. And so um, the operating system trying to do that, and by the operating system, I mean the device driver as well. The issue with that trying to be computed on the host is that the disk itself is already doing a lot of that stuff because they're much more intelligent than you might think today. So while in the old days, this kind of disk scheduling was definitely done by the operating system device driver combination, um, today, uh, some of it is still done, but it's a, a bit redundant with what the disk can do. Okay, so I wanna finish up, uh, actually, I think we'll pick this up next time. So in conclusion, uh, we talked about disk performance uh, a lot last time, and we brought it back by talking about queuing time plus controller plus seek plus rotational plus transfer time. We talked about rotational latency, right? So that's the on average half of a rotation. The transfer time has to do with the spec of the disk as to how fast it is um, pulling things off the disk. Technically, it also depends on whether you're reading from the outer track or the inner track because the transfer times uh, are faster in the outer tracks but usually we give you an average transfer time. This queuing time uh, was something that we didn't talk about initially, um, but the devices have a very complex interaction and performance characteristics. We talked about queue plus overhead plus transfer um, and the question of sort of an effective bandwidth, which varies based on the devices. We talked about that last time. This queue is really an interesting thing, right? So the file system, which we, we haven't quite gotten to, is really gonna need to optimize performance and reliability relative to a bunch of these uh, different parameters. Um, and the other thing that we talked a, a lot about today is the fact that bursts and high utilization in, introduce queuing delays. And so finally, this queuing latency um, for MM1, which is memoryless input, memoryless output, one queue, or memoryless input, general output, one queue, are very simplest to analyze. And uh, basically, you can say that the time in the queue is the time to service times this one half one plus C factor times row over one minus row, and that goes to infinity as latency as uh, utilization goes to 100%. Okay. Um, next time we'll talk a lot more about file systems. Uh, we didn't get to them today, but um, we'll pick up with the fat file system, and then we'll move on to which is in use today, and then we'll move on to some real file systems. Uh, that are more interesting than the fat file system next time as well. So I'm going to uh, bid adieu to everybody. Please vote tomorrow. Very important. Um, try not to be stressed about it. Uh, I think it'll all work out well in the grand scheme. All righty. You have a good night.